Hi everyone, my name is Jay Sable and I'm the Executive Director of the One Community 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're a highest good of all organization, the purpose of which is to create the solution to everything. Truly, our path to doing this is through open source and free shared blueprints for complete civilizations uh, built off of sustainable and self-replicating teacher demonstration communities, villages, and cities to be built all around the world. This is our weekly update number 33, uh, covering our progress for the week of October 7th, 2013, as we continue to move forward, and is always the format with these video blogs. You can uh, click on the link in the YouTube video of more information section and see a written blog of all this with the time stamped a uh, bullet point list of everything I'm talking about and where you can click on the video to hear the details. And uh, I'm going to go through that first, bullet point list first, and then I'll wrap around it and I'll talk about each one of those bullet points in detail, as well as how to make such a crazy statement like we're here to create the solution for everything. And so I think I'll wrap up with that today. And we're actually doing a video, uh, sorry, a uh, radio show on this on Monday as well with author Jack Reed, and I'll talk about that at the end after I go through the bullet points. So first things first, let's talk about our video update uh, number 33 for the week of October 7, 2013. In this last week, we completed our food forest plants. Uh, 195 plants are now done behind the scenes. All the research on that, cultural considerations, planting guidelines, all of that stuff is done. Choosing the images, that kind of deal, all done behind the scenes. We've got a third of Zenopini 1 plants are now up on the website, which is the edited version of everything that we've now got done for the food forest, including the images, including descriptions, cultural considerations, all that stuff. And I will include actually an example of that in the written blog. And of course, if you want to see it in detail, you can just uh, go to the written blog and then click on the link, which will take you to our whole infrastructure, planting and harvesting guidelines for all the aquapinis and wallapinis. Uh, plastic research continues. It's a much bigger deal than we thought. There are some really revolutionary and amazing things that have happened with plastic uh, right now, with polycarbonate uh, plastic and the different things that are out there, and so we continue the research on that. Um, Pod 1 furniture is progressing now, thanks to the help of Philip Gill, and I'll post a couple more updates for that. He's an interior design architect who's creating some really amazing custom furniture designs that will be easy to duplicate and will integrate in really beautifully with the Earthbag Village uh, domes. We've got uh, a new collage, also a new export, thanks to the amazing work of Devin Porter and what he's doing as far as the Earthbag Village in 3D, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail here when I come back around. Um, Sego Center uh, internal railings are done, and we're starting to work on the stairs now, so I'll show some pictures of that in the written blog, talk about that in a second, as well as the Sego Center uh, walk-in refrigerator, freezer, and canning and preserving area of the kitchen. We're putting the final details on that. Uh, it looks complete other than maybe some little touch-up stuff, but I will show, I will post a collage of pictures of that area and talk about that in a second as well. Uh, so if you want to see pictures, check out the written blog. And um, we've started this last week a huge push for architects and engineers. And so, or sorry, not architects and engineers, engineers and 3D people. Architecture part is pretty much covered, but we're really looking for engineering help right now. So anybody watching this uh, who knows world change people that would like to get involved in something that is truly historic, creating the solution to everything. Uh, if you know an engineer, structural engineers, electrical engineers, plumbing engineers, mechanical engineers, we are looking for engineers to help partner with us right now and uh, put some of the finishing touches on the things that we've designed. We've had them looked over by engineers, but we need the actual calculations, and thus far we don't have anybody willing to do that. So this last week, we created a whole marketing campaign to really push for that, and maybe you're somebody who's been attracted to our project from that marketing campaign, so if you are, uh, welcome to our weekly update blog, and we'd love to have you helping us. So we shot a couple of videos to help promote that, created a couple pages. We'll add links to both of those pages in this written blog uh, description as well. And if you know anybody, please point them at our project. We would love to uh, increase our collaborative partners in the engineering department and in the 3D SketchUp department, which we've done a ton of work there. So I'll talk a little bit more about that when I come around. And then uh, Education for Life continues to move forward. This last week, we spent a whole bunch of time on creating curriculum timelines for specific subjects. Um, we're starting with what we consider will be the easiest subject. It's still a huge amount of work 
which is breaking down math and putting a timeline. I'll talk about what that means. And then we started creating the graphic for what it's going to look like in uh, for each subject. So math, English, social sciences, etc. And I'll talk about that as I come around. And then last but not least, uh, we spent a lot of time this last week along with this push uh, seeking engineers as well as 3D folks. Spent a lot of time promoting this radio show that is coming up uh, with Jack Reed. And Jack Reed is the author of The Next Evolution, A Blueprint for Transforming the World. Uh, interestingly enough, his book is almost identical to what it is that one community is purposed to create. Uh, I guess I'll tell you that story here when I come back around. So first things first, let's come back to the beginning. That's our update. That's our overview of everything that's accomplished. And now I'd like to just talk in depth on what each one of those bullet points are. And I try and say every time during these blogs that there's some reiteration. These blogs are meant to be standalone uh, blogs sharing everything that we're doing. So I repeat myself a lot and talking about what the vision is, what the bigger uh, picture is and, and that we're creating with one community because uh, I don't expect everybody to watch all of our blogs, especially since this is number 33. Uh, you know, people have 30 hours or 40 hours to sit down and watch all of our blogs. You should help us instead. So um, going back through the details, I said that our purpose is to create a solution for everything. And what that means is we're creating a comprehensive solution, not a bandage, not a, a small fix, but a complete and comprehensive solution to what we see as all of the world's uh, most pressing problems of our generation and for generations to come. So it's way, way beyond food. It's way beyond just energy. It's way beyond housing, although food, energy, and housing in third world countries is what's needed most. But we see that once those things are achieved, then what about education? What about for-profit, non-profit business models to help people get out of debt or to establish a working uh, economy or a business model that's going to provide revenue into areas that wouldn't be getting it? What about, what about social architecture and fulfilled living? Once the basic needs are met and people have enough food and they have energy and they, you know, they can flip a switch and their lights come on in third world countries, what about once you know, they have housing that is going to last and is quality, then what about the social architecture aspect? Or for people here in the United States where the housing and the food and the energy is pretty easy to just buy and set that up, what about creating a style of living that far surpasses what we're experiencing right now? What about putting the rat race behind us and really living life as an experience uh, in and of itself, as a goal, as happiness, and fulfilled living as a goal in and of itself? while simultaneously providing something greater to the world, to family humanity. And so all of these things are put together in the one community model, and that's why we talk about it as a solution for everything. And it's not just about the solution. It's about how the so solution self-propagates, creating a model that will self-replicate, that will duplicate itself, so it will spread throughout the world and take the resources Take the resources that are needed most to the places where they're needed most, as well as providing something for everyone, wherever they're at, whatever demographic they're in, right now. And this is why everything that we do is open source, it's free shared, and it's designed to be implemented either modularly as individual components where somebody might just want to build, maybe all they need is food infrastructure, or maybe all they want is food infrastructure, maybe all they want is a guest house. That idea of spreading sustainable building into regular neighborhoods, building guest houses that are artistic and sustainable and will last hundreds of years, more affordable than traditional building and more durable than traditional building and more artistic than most traditional buildings. That is very, very exciting to us. Maybe that's all people need, but maybe, maybe they need a complete city infrastructure. Maybe they need waste disposal and water saving techniques and storage. Maybe they need complete food production infrastructure. Maybe they need housing as well. Maybe they need energy infrastructure. A third of the population of the world does not have energy right now. And so our goal is to provide that as well and to make it so appealing through the educational model, through the, through the early childhood and education for life program, to make it so appealing for the using the social architecture, the fulfilled living model, application of a resource-based economy that saves people tons of money, 
for-profit and non-profit highest good business models that will help people to get out of debt, to take all of those things and make them so appealing that the mainstream public will adopt these models and start to adapt these models in the ways that work best for the individual and for groups of people, creating endless iterations and different versions of one community all around the world so that people can plug into those and continue to evolve it. And the idea, the ultimate idea, the solution to everything, and Jack Reed says it, he says the solution for everything is the solution to anything. And the idea with that is to create that solution for everything, that foundational platform, open source and free shared platform for people then to expand upon and to make it as affordable enough and to make it easy enough and to make it appealing enough so the mainstream public starts adopting the idea and spreading the idea and adapting the idea. And that's the platform. And so all this stuff that we're doing every single week, all the things that we're checking off and the team we're constantly building, are all the people that want to help us complete these different elements, food, energy, housing, social architecture, education, for-profit, non-profit business models. Everything we're doing is bringing that together and then going to build one community as the ultimate, or rather, not even the ultimate, because it'll be the first. Honestly, probably, successive iterations will be significantly better than one community. But to build the ultimate starting point, to build the ultimate starting point, and that starting point will be seven different teacher demonstration villages and models, complete with the education model, everything that we're doing to set it up as not, that we've already done to set it up as a non-profit, and then the for-profit aspects of one community which will operate under a separate entity, the ecotourism model, how to operate all that stuff, how to work within code, how to adapt to code, how to adapt all of the open source structures when we move out there and start building everything, how we adapt those to our environment, how we evolve those, and then working in collaboration with any other organization that wants to sign on for the highest good of all philosophy and help be a part of the solution too. Building a sustainable and self-sufficient civilization from the ground up, which in our opinion, this is the first time in history that we would be capable of doing what it is that we're doing right now because 10, 15 years ago, the internet wasn't what it is, didn't really even exist, you know? 10, 15 years ago, Facebook didn't exist. The ability to share what it is that we're doing and put it out there to a global audience and reach out and find the people globally that want to participate and be a part of one community either as community pioneers moving onto the property and helping us build everything, as satellite pioneers, people that want to integrate in with everything that we're doing right now and be a part of the change and the transformation with the idea that they're going to build a community or a village or a city somewhere else, but integrating in with our core structure right now to learn everything we're doing, or as a collaborative partner or cooperative partner uh, and consultant to the project just helping us, working with us virtually to complete, check off the action items necessary to be able to have one community a shovel ready to be able to launch complete and full and build the whole thing and then open, multiply our open source creation and sharing a thousandfold from what we're doing right now, bringing on more and more people and expanding and growing and contributing indefinitely to solution-based thinking and creating what the world needs and wants to be able to continue to build more iterations and thus the whole self-propagating model. That's what we're doing. So, and if this sounds crazy, you should call in on the show. I will include the link, which will evolve into the actual video, the, the recording of the show. But it's a live call-in show. We've scheduled a two-hour show. If we don't have people calling in, I will just list all the questions that we get so commonly, and we'll go through that. But it's a live show, and we're requesting people to call in, ask us, pose a question, pose an example of how this would address world hunger, how this addresses world poverty, how this addresses uh, crime, how this addresses education. It's the solution for everything. We've thought about this. I've thought about this for 15 years I put into planning and organizing this before we launched the website and really got serious and I made this a full-time endeavor for myself and started building a team three years ago. It is a solution for everything. And I invite, I challenge people to call in and give us any example of something that it's not the solution to. But the infrastructure has to be built. The foundation, one working model, has to be created to demonstrate what is possible 
And it's got to be designed, in our opinion, in a way that is open source and free shared so that people can duplicate it or it won't become self-replicating. And everything that we're doing is to be self-replicating, to create a place that people can visit, where they can put their hands in the dirt, where they can eat food that they've never even heard of, that's amazing, from all around the world, and understand that they can grow this food too, in their backyard, if they want to, building one of the Akapini and Wallapini structures to know exactly how much it's going to cost, how many hours of labor it will take, what needs to be done for permitting, what needs to be done to take care of these plants, where you need to go to buy all of these plants, to grow a diversity of food that far surpasses, just food is just one example, far surpasses what you could get in the grocery store. Promoting biodiversity, locally grown in your backyard, without the use of pesticides or herbicides or anything that you wouldn't actually want to put in your body. One example of what it is that we're doing. This is the idea of what it is that we're creating. So, if you want to read more about that, check out our methodology page, onecommunityglobal.org forward slash methodology. And that gives you an idea. That is the page that really has the details. Or join us on the radio show, or if you're watching this now, uh, click on the link and you can either join us live on the radio show or listen to the recorded show uh, if that's your preference. So, moving on. Anyway, this last week, I talked about food diversity that is uh, unlike anything that you can buy in the grocery store. I've talked about this in past in past blogs as well. If you want to see an example of this, go to our website and look at Wallapini number two. No, Wallapini, yes, Wallapini two. And the 50 different types of apples, just as one example, and 50 different types of figs as another example, that will be grown in that structure. 50 different types. Most people are only familiar with three or four apples because that's what is popular right now. But there's there's literally hundreds of different types of apples. And so we've chosen 50 of the most amazing to put together and partner with an amazing organization to provide all of those. Go and check it out. If you like apples, contact our partner at Century Farm Orchards and order an apple tree with an apple that you would never, ever buy in the grocery store because it's not available in the grocery store, but has these amazing properties that just don't work for sitting on a shelf and for long distance transportation, or they're not attractive enough to market them because they come out all kinds of different shapes, but they taste amazing. Well, the food forest plant plan is a, a great example of extending this to creating a self-sufficient environment outside. And if you want to see the page on the food forest right now, we have the list of all of the plants is already up. Then you can go to onecommunityglobal.org forward slash food forest, and you can see the list of all the plants that are going to be grown outside. Creating these environments and a food forest, if you're not familiar with it, there's a video on there that'll explain exactly what that is and how you produce a food forest. But creating these environments that really operate on their own, growing, producing amazing food, and once you get them up and running, I mean, literally, you would have to go in and physically remove them to stop them from producing food because you create an entire ecosystem. And so, our botanist, Michael Martin, has spent, uh, man, I mean, on our complete food infrastructure, hundreds of hours just researching and selecting plants and he's already got this amazing wealth of knowledge in his head to draw from but now researching that and going to the next level to be able to bring the details together and so behind the scenes Michael has completed the final uh, plants of the food forest which I think it's up to just under 200 plants and so we've done all the research uh, behind the scenes to get all that stuff done and so now it's just a process of formatting final editing, reading through it, you know, we have three or four people that work on this kind of, this aspect, the food forest and the food production aspects, reading it, editing it, editing the photos, and then putting that stuff up on the website for the website design. But behind the scenes, it's all done. And if you want to see what it's going to look like uh, once it's on the website, we've got a third of the Zenapini 1 plants are now done and up on the website, which means they're edited, the pictures are edited, we've got a complete description on there, we've got the cultural considerations, we have the planting guidelines, which is why these plants were selected and where they're going to be planted and uh, and how they're going to be received. And then in the case of the Zenapini 1, we also have all of the purchasing details. Where would you actually buy every single plant that's on that list so that you can source this stuff if you just want to grow one or two of the things that we've selected, you know, maybe in your own garden or something, where would you get your hands on that? We've got all that information that is up on the website too. So take a look at it, check it out. There's even a link right now uh, where you can link and see the unedited stuff until it's all up on the website and then uh, you can take a look and see what it looks like unedited and how it gets transferred over and uh, that's where we're at with the food forest. 
So Zenopini 1, a third of the plants are up on the website now, which means um, we're almost done. You know, once we get Zenopini 1 done, then we have Zenopini 2, and when Zenopini 2 is complete, then we'll start transferring over the food forest plants, and then we will be done with all of the plants, or at least have the infrastructure in place so that we can add to it endlessly, but we'll be done with the research until we start actually planting things and, so, uh, and putting things up on the website. So very exciting to see all that stuff done and just uh, a massive coordination of efforts of four or five members of our team working pretty consistently just on this piece and putting it together. And so now that Michael's done with this piece, we're just going to start focusing on something else. And so you see us coming forward with some updates on uh, some other areas. We've got still a few little tweaks and stuff that we're doing behind the scenes on this stuff, but start focusing our attention on other aspects. Um, I mentioned that plastic research continues, so, man, it's been a couple weeks working on this. There's just a whole bunch of different stuff that's out there. We put it out into the forums and the blogs. Thank you for everybody that has contributed ideas for us. Um, all these ideas just lead us farther and farther down the rabbit hole seeing what's out there. And so um, we've got a team call to talk about this uh, tomorrow evening and, ta and really talk as a group about what it is that we want to look at as far as plastic goes because we found some really revolutionary and amazing plastics and the question that we have to ask ourselves is how does it work with our open source goals you know what kind of global distribution do they have are we creating something where people have to buy the plastic from the exact same place where we do or would a better choice maybe exist where we might have something that might not be the ultimate plastic to use but it would be easier to source from multiple locations and so from an open source goal perspective, from the idea of building what it is that we're talking about in, say, Haiti, uh, or building what it is that we're talking about in Africa, you know, then maybe there might be a better choice. And so we just got to talk about it because the research just keeps turning over all these amazing things. And then some of them, you know, what's the price point? Because we still want to make everything maximally affordable as well. And so... There's a lot. So that research continues. Exciting to see that moving ahead. Um, on pod one, the Earthbag Village, uh, furniture design is coming along. I said Philip Gill has got some really cool furniture designs. I'll post a few pictures of those. Uh, the furniture designs that we're looking at right now is how do you turn a 200 square foot earth dome into a space that would really work for a family? And so, um, you know, like a family of three or four. And so the way that we're doing that is uh, right now, Philip has designed some really beautiful uh, furniture that could be custom designed, built in, where the back backboard of the bed would come up and support the ceiling. And because these earth domes have 15 foot high ceilings, uh, you have this backboard, and I'll post pictures of this in the written blog. You have a backboard that comes up to say about the eight foot level, which is a pretty good ceiling. And then it spreads out, and behind that, you would have your closets, you would have hanging for clothes and things like that and a little ladder that would take you up into a secondary loft that would take the top half of that dome and use that either for storage or for a little shared kids room, uh, bunk room, something like that. And so really, really cool designs. And then the bed would also be a fold up bed. So a Murphy bed that would fold up and as that bed folded up, uh, a desk would fold down that would create a desk space for people that wanted it or you could just leave the Murphy bed down with that desk option to be able to fold that thing up put down a desk and then you have a workspace and it opens up all your area. And so really cool designs. I got the pictures from Philip to put up. Uh, the initial idea with that, we're just talking about it more and, f and fleshing it out more. But it's cool to see these things coming together. Um, also, uh, for the Earth Bag Village, we have some really great progress as far as the 3D is concerned. We've now got all the domes done. We realized that we could actually put another three do triple dome uh, uh, sorry, another three dome cluster down, whereas before we thought it was going to be a two dome cluster. And so this adds a third dome and still have the shower domes there. And so we've got everything in place now. We've got the windows in the bathrooms. We've got the windows uh, in the in the toilet dome, sorry, in the toilet dome and in the shower dome. And we've worked that out. We're doing some little details as far as uh, the entryways and things like that. But a lot of progress as far as putting things into place and actually being able to walk around in it. And so hopefully in the next week or two, tops we'll be able to get those that last three dome cluster in put in the paths and we can start kind of putting in some trees and some plants and we'll have michael take a look at his food forest list and find some 3d plants for us in the sketchup warehouse so we can start making it look like what it's really going to look like 
and people could get a better idea of what the experience of living in the Earthbag Village is going to look like. Then all of this is purpose to design uh, the first of the village prototypes, which is the most affordable. And we think we're, we're going to, well, we know we're going to bring the price down significantly, but even at the prices that we've, we've estimated, and we're building in a 30% cushion into our prices, uh, we're estimating that you'll be able to build a village for 100 people, more than 100 people, uh, for less than the cost of three or four houses. I've been saying two houses in California, three or four houses maybe elsewhere. The reality of it is that I think we're going to come in at under uh, $500,000 for the whole village, not counting the energy infrastructure. If you build the whole energy infrastructure and everything, um, plus the uh, waste treatment and all-natural waste treatment, integrating in traditional septic, uh, definitely come out well under a million dollars. And so you think, might think, whoa, a million dollars, but wait a minute. This is for 100 people to live, including food production, energy infrastructure, all of that stuff for under a million dollars. You could build the homes itself if you just wanted to build, say, a, uh, a guest house or something like that for yourself in your backyard. You could build one of these for under $5,000. And that's really what we're talking about. It's just the other aspects, the tropical atrium, the food production, the energy infrastructure, all that starts adding on to it. And so now that we've got the, the infinite details down to you know buying the toilet paper dispensers and buying the urinals for the for the um, communal bathrooms and buying the shower heads and all this different stuff uh, now that we've got all that done you know those prices really really add up you know how do you sterilize that bathroom you know these kinds of deals so we have all this stuff that we're looking at that we've been doing the research on which on that note you know, we also uh, we're almost done we've got the pages up but we're still putting the final details on it and uh, we should be hopefully announcing that this coming week um, is a showerhead page. We did tons of research on just on showerheads. Was I don't know probably ten hours of research or something just on showerheads, and then maybe another fifteen hours on, or sorry, another five hours or something on that, organizing it and getting pictures and putting it all together, taking everything we did, bouncing it back and forth, you know, to come up with the twelve uh, low uh, use water showerheads and the quality of those, like which ones are we going to use. And so we're going to test out, I think it's 11 or 12, that we're going to start out with at one community, and then we'll open source share our experience with that. And we're the perfect place to do it because we have a large group of people sharing these shower heads and using them and testing them out so we get a big, broad diversity of people and what their experience is of this, and then we'll be inviting the public to come in and share. And so our idea is we'll actually have bathrooms that will be named after the shower heads so that people can try the different shower heads. And since it's a daily experience, that is really important to most people, uh, and we're so interested in sa saving water, it's a great opportunity to really test out a bunch of different shower heads, see what's available, and give our feedback. And we think it's a great example of what one community is all about in that we're just one giant, indefinite, ongoing, perpetual research and development organization. People that are into eco-living, people that are into doing the right thing for the planet, right thing for people, right thing for all life on this planet, as well as you know things that support the economy and creating a, a viable business model on top of all that. Uh, you know, a model that saves people money, provides more resources and a higher standard of quality of living for most people. How do we do that? Well, our shower research is a great example of uh, one way that we're taking one little piece of one community and how we're tackling that and how we're gonna be sharing all that information. And so that shower page is going to go up once we build one community. Then we'll have a whole bunch of more information and we'll, we'll put out, you know, the feedback once we've used all these different shower heads for a couple months on our experience. And then we'll be able to track that long term as far as durability, what the use is, what people like, and just put that information out there. So when people come and visit one community, you visit one community for seven days, you can try seven different shower heads if you want. You can talk to people and find out what it is. You can see what the patterns are for what people like as far as the shower heads go and what our experience is. And then when we build the Straw Bale Village, we'll be able to take that information that we've learned. People will be able to choose using that and we'll continue to expand this with new technology if it comes out, etc. And so that's the reason we've created a shower head page. And so the details of that are coming together. It's not finished yet. We're still wrapping up some of the formatting, but it's coming soon as part of the Earthbag Village and that's why I wanted to share it. So uh, Sago Center, uh, Sago Center Duplicable City Hub is a city center designed to be duplicated anywhere in the world to create an immediate 
uh, revenue stream for people as soon as it's finished you could operate it and generate a revenue stream for people so that then they could use that to pay off debt and fund the expansion of a village built around it villages don't need a sago center in one community's case we've chosen sago center to build the sago center because it'll provide group dining for some uh, 150 to 200 people at a time so really group dining for you know 400 people if you were to do two dinner shifts two breakfast shifts kind of deal and uh, that eliminates the need for all of one community to build individual um, laundry facilities, individual kitchens, all this different stuff. Because our organization is a research and de development organization, wants to demonstrate maximum efficiency. And so we're putting the resources into building this really beautiful and amazing Sego Center, duplicable city hub. And then the homes will be much, much smaller because we have this recreational space. We have this uh, group collaborative and cooperative laundry space and dining space and all this stuff is put together. And so in the last week, we finished all the external railings, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're working with round structures and when you see the magnitude of the Sego Center and what it is went into that, um, all of those external railings is really a big deal. Oh, sorry, that was last week. Hello, the week before last week, the next one. This week we finished all the internal railings. So we posted pictures of the external railings last week. This week we finished all the internal railings and now we're working on the stairs. And so same thing with the internal railings and the dining dome, the internal railings and the social dome. All those things have gone in and you can see those pictures as well. Just really beautiful work. Uh, and it starts to really give you an idea, put things into perspective about what the size of these domes are and what the space is going to be like as a recreational space so that people feel comfortable with a home that is more like a hotel room or a home that's more like a, like a dorm room, you know, only a couple hundred square feet, but it only needs to be a couple hundred square feet when you're not spending all day in it watching TV, when you're really just going there for sleep and intimacy and private time or, you know, to read a book or something like that, but really probably wouldn't even read a book like book, book there when you could walk you know, 100, 200 feet and instead read a book in the tropical atrium, you know, or you could walk 15 minutes and read a book in the library in the Sego Center. And so the resource efficiency and the savings is just ridiculous. So also as part of that, um, we've got the refrigerator area, refrigeration area is now done. Carl Harris has finished that area. I'm just waiting for the pictures on that and I'm, I'll put together a collage on that as well and include that in the written blog. Um, but we talked about the final little details and he's touching those up right now. And so uh, that is the walk-in walk -in refrigerator as well as the uh, walk-in freezer and then the canning and preserves area that is behind that. And so all those details are done right down to the knife rack on the wall. Uh, those final pieces that we were putting in there to show you what that area is going to look like. And it's really, it's really stellar and beautiful and a super important part of one community because it represents those aspects. That refrigerator is going to be a refrigerator for hundreds of people. Imagine the savings when you have a refrigerator like that, a walk-in refrigerator that really services hundreds of people. Not everybody needs to do it this way, but this is the way we're organizing the maximum efficiency of this building and of one community as a whole is to have that space to be a collaborative and cooperative space that's shared by everybody. So um, those details are done. Uh, also, I had mentioned that we are now starting a push for architects and engineers. If uh, you know people that are engineers, sorry, I keep saying architects, not architects and engineers, engineers and more 3D graphics people. We already have an amazing 3D team working in SketchUp, and we're choosing SketchUp because it can be, uh, it's a free program, and everybody has access to it, and so we want to put this out to the mainstream and get people involved in the design process. So we're looking for more SketchUp artists to join our amazing SketchUp team to take everything, everything that I've discussed, at least the beginnings of it, are already in SketchUp. So um, some of it is really progressed, like the Sego Center, as you can hear, we're putting the finishing details on that. You know, our, our food infrastructure is way into the design process in SketchUp, but it needs to be taken, it needs to be finished, and then we need to put it together so you can see a blueprint of the entire food infrastructure, not just the large-scale Aquapini or Zenapini 1, etc. So we are looking for 3D people and we're looking for engineers. Uh, everything that we've done has been looked over by a civil engineer, has been looked over by a couple different engineers, and we're, we know that it's doable. There's nothing in there that's crazy or impossible. The earth bag buildings have already been approved in at least one county using Cal Earth's uh, plans, but we need to duplicate that stuff on our own. And so we're really looking for some hardcore uh, cutting-edge engineering help 
for people that really want to expand the international building code, that want to be a part of world change, that recognize that what we're doing is out of the box, it's not crazy, it just hasn't been done yet, but once we design it, we prove that it's safe, and not only safe, but it lasts longer, it's more durable, it's more wind resistant, it's more tornado resistant, more earthquake resistant than, than traditional buildings. Once we build these things, it can change the way that people decide to live. That's really the idea. You know, imagine if, you know, calamity strikes somewhere and, and, you know, devastation hits an area. And instead of going in there and building more houses out of, you know, sticks, we go in there and we build earth domes and we build, you know, straw bale. We build structures that are more durable than what's being done right now and recreate those environments with sustainable infrastructure. You know, with really with things that are really good for the planet, good for people. That's what we're trying to do. So uh, this last week, we put a ton of time into putting together a marketing plan. And this coming week, we're going to really be pushing that out, looking for nonprofit help uh, in every major city around the, uh, the country, at least, using Craigslist, putting it out there and just saying, hey, we're looking for engineering help. Electrical engineers, plumbing engineers, structural engineers. We are creating complete, sustainable civilizations and the infrastructure is just a piece of it, but it's a big piece. And so we're looking for people to join our team. We've got an amazing way to support those folks, just like you hear me talking about the people that are helping out with our project and doing work. We will promote the folks that help us ongoing, and we'll be have credits. You know, when we start putting this stuff together and actually building it, we'll give credit to everybody that helps us along the way, and then you know, be referring people to the folks that contribute to our project, saying, hey. You know, this is the person who did these calculations for us. If you want to modify it, you should talk to them. They're the person. And so our idea with this whole model and why it's so supportive and why it's a win for everybody, because we don't want to put people out of business. We want to provide business to an industry. We want to create a new market for sustainability, of people interested in sustainability, providing for the folks that help us. And our idea with that is to create the foundations, to make it open source, to make it as easy to duplicate as possible. Because we know that if we do that, we we'll bring the prices down. It's doing so much work that people would normally have to pay for. But then what they can do is they can take the money that they normally would have spent on these basics, which we're giving away for free, and they can evolve it. They can make it better. They can make it more beautiful. And that's where our collaborative partners come in. You know, the people that are helping us right now, everybody with one community is an unpaid volunteer, self-included. None of us are making any money on this. We're all here to create world change. And so for the people that want to do this, though, there's a huge reward. For the people moving onto the property, you're going to be a part of world change. You're going to be a part of making history. You get to be a part of building the first version of this. For the people that are collaborative partners, you get to be a part of world change. And the long-term benefits is you get the residual benefit, the, the business that will be referring to people who help us being listed as a collaborative partner, being listed on all of the videos, the hundreds of videos that we're going to put out, thousands of videos that we will be putting out, promoting one community. And so within the credits of that, we'll be discussing the people that helped. You know, it's a big deal to donate your time to something like this. It takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of courage. I've been told it takes a lot of courage. I don't feel like it takes courage, but I know that we're creating it. There's no doubt in my mind that we're going to succeed. So, but for people that don't know that, we know that it takes a lot of courage. And so the rewards, though, the long-term benefits, the long-term rewards are huge. And so we've got a whole page to describe that, uh, which is onecommunityglobal.org forward slash win. talks about our promotional engine and links to some more information on how we can reward the collaborative partners and the people that want to work with us. You know, or become a pioneer. Join us as a pioneer and move on to the property and actually build all this stuff with us. Pretty cool. So, um, yeah, so we started a big push. We're doing all that. We'll continue that for the next week. And then the Education for Life update is my second to last update. Uh, Education for Life program, what we're doing is we're spending all this time working on what do you do with a subject. How do you create a timeline that represents math, say, which is where we're starting. Everything that you need to learn from learning how to recognize numbers and counting to odd, even, and negatives and positives and fractions to pre-algebra and algebra and calculus and trigonometry and geometry and all this different stuff. What does that look like on a timeline? And then how do you take that timeline and turn it into a three-dimensional or at least a two-dimensional circle instead? And you eliminate that linear need for linear education because there's lots of kids that are prodigies that learn how to 
prodigies, prodigies that learn how to do one thing and then they back learn everything else. But how do you create it so that a kid can take a learning path that is linear if they want it? Or they could say, well, you know, I think that I'm ready to learn fractions. And this is something that I've been doing with my son uh, now for years. He's five. Uh, he does algebra in a way that would blow your mind. And he loves it. He doesn't realize that he's learning complex math stuff that I learned in, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade. I think was when I was starting to learn some of these algebra concepts and geometry. He's really big on geometry, you know. And I remember I think that was seventh or eighth grade when I was getting into geometry as well. Some of it was in high school. So the point on this is, is you know, if we if we get off this need, if we let go, or if we can create a structure, where we don't need a timeline, and we just say, okay, learning is a body and it's a concept that is math that includes all of this. And then last week I talked about the mind maps that we're doing that will allow you to teach math. So I take this body here as a concept of a theme of the week that might be the human body or space or time or summer or fall or winter or any of those different things. And you teach math within the context of that. So it has meaning and it's all hands-on and creative. It can be adapted. This concept of math can be adapted to any age group within this format, within this context right here. And it's individual. And now it becomes a collaboration between the student and the teacher to work on their education because they say, well, this is what I know. And then the whole thing is evaluated based on national standards and SAT tests, as well as uh, national testing standards, which is what we're studying to uh, clearly identify this timeline and then creating this circle. And that's exactly what we've done where all these things are different connected. And then you have layers of learning within that. So you have seven different layers of learning going all the way out to somebody who would be in a, maybe an engineer or an architect in the far, farthest layer because it's education for life and then a layer in from that would be high school proficiency and being able to ace an SAT and then a layer in, a layer in all the way down to the most basic layer which would be number recognition. And then creating that layer now you have fields of learning like this and doesn't mean that you couldn't start in an outside layer you don't have to travel on it this way but we're creating a template so that you can teach learning 3D, like a 3D engagement of the learning experience instead of the way that it's done right now. And it doesn't, and the beauty of it is, is the way that it's done right now can still be used. It can be used within the context of this and you just start filling it out. And so we've got a way of assessing that and um, evaluating that with students. So it becomes a collaborative effort. And the older the students become, the more hands on they can be and the more they can guide themselves through this process which isn't just math. So we have math, and then we have social sciences, which we think is going to be one of the hardest ones. And then we've also, of course, got art and music, and then you've got science and English, and all these different things, each one of them having their own sphere. And so that's the kind of stuff that's happening with the Education for Life program that we're doing behind the scenes. It is ridiculously cool. And so um, the graphic is starting to come together on that. I don't think it's ready to put a picture up yet, but uh, it is starting to come together what that's going to look like. Maybe I'll put a picture up. Eh, we'll see. So, and then, um, and, uh, and, and that line, that timeline is starting to take shape. Like the research has been done on it. We're still just kind of working with it to make sure we're not missing anything because we've got to check against the, the national standards and California standards is what we're using because they're some of the strictest. Make sure we didn't miss anything. And then we're going to cross reference that with our entire curriculum on the website, which is already done to make sure nothing's missed there. Create these images. And then we'll have a whole suite, an educational suite that will teach all of these different subjects within the context of 30 different um, themes is what we're starting with. Like I said, space or time or the human body or you know uh, um, something like uh, one, of, uh, one of the seasons or something like that. And so we're creating all that. And so, uh, yeah, solution to everything. This is one piece. We think education is a huge piece. We think it should be in the hands of everybody. It should be freely available to everyone. And so our Open Source Education for Life program it's a big part of that. We see it plugging into the Khan Academy. If you're not familiar with the Khan Academy, uh, K-A-H-N, K-A-H-N, I think, the Academy, check it out. Amazing free resource. What we're doing fits beautifully with that free resource, and it's something totally different. But they go hand in hand, and um, just really an amazing organization. And so what we're creating is to build on that. We don't want to reinvent the wheel where it doesn't need to be reinvented. We want to keep expanding. And so that's what's up with the Education for Life program. So, and then last but not least, I said that we got a radio show, which uh, is Monday, Columbus Day at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you click on the link in the, uh, if you click on the link 
in the description, the YouTube description. You can join us for that show. Uh, it's a live show. Jack and I, Jack Reed, the author of The Next Evolution, a blueprint for transforming the planet, is going to be uh, co co. What is that? Co not co-hosting because we're not hosting it. Where he's going to be joining me, me to talk on. He's going to be joining me. He and I are going to be talking on that show about how we're creating the solution to everything and how what we're doing is the solution to everything. How is that? We'll be taking callers, uh, calling in and asking questions. Like if, you, if you have a question about it or if you have a solution, a suggestion, well, how would this work within a community setting like what you're talking about? How is this a solution to this? How is the solution to health problems? How is the solution to education? How is the solution to all these different things? How is it? Ask questions. Call in, you can ask questions or you can click on the link and if it's after, if the time has passed, if it's past 1 p.m. Pacific uh, Standard Time, Los Angeles time uh, on Monday, Columbus Day, then uh, you can go and you can watch that or listen to that show uh, on our on our website. So, um, and related to that, uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I know, like I know in my heart, I know in my soul, that this is the solution for everything, is really because as based on how I met Jack Reed. Um, Several people had told me to read his book. Have you read The Next Evolution? It's our website. Have you read The Next Evolution? You read The Next No, no, I haven't read The Next Evolution. You know, and then I ran, somebody sent me a video of this guy. And the video is up on our methodology page. Go to onecommunityglobal.org forward slash methodology. You can see the video that I watched. And I get videos all the time. You know, and something compelled me to watch this video. I started watching it. And I said, man, I've never seen anybody that I agree with so strongly. Like what this guy is describing is what it is that we're creating. He's describing the solution to everything. We're creating the solution to everything. I've been thinking about the solution to everything for 15 years. What does that look like? We launched this website. I, at that point, I'd spent a year full-time working on the website, developing it, putting it out there. I said, I gotta contact this guy. And so I sent him an email and I said, hey Jack, uh, my name's Jay. You should check out our website because I think we might have the same brain. Uh, everything, I watched this video and everything in that video Everything you said, we've got a website that we're designing a pro project to build that. And he checked out the website and he wrote me back and he said, have you read my book? I said, no, I've not read your book. He goes, I want to send you a copy of my book for Christmas. This was two Thanksgivings ago. Two, 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 I think, uh, yeah, two Thanksgivings ago. So, yes, <laughs> two Thanksgivings ago. And so he sent me the book, and I read the book. Not The first half of the book is talking about why we need to make a change. It's everything I'd studied in my holistic health career. I mean, some of the same quotes. He had the same quote from our website on the back of his book. And then when he got into the solutions, it was one community. The only thing that was not almost identical is, and there's a few little things, but I mean, there were, I made a list of the things like, oh my God, exactly the same, the same, same, like that. One of the only things that wasn't almost identical is the consensus that's because I didn't understand it. And since then, Jack has taught two consensus trainings. Interestingly enough, the first consensus training, um, we sat down and we created what is now our project teams and our welcome teams and how one community organizes. It turned out to be what we created in that and the ASAP and how we log our time. Like how we organized ourselves and how we came up with our own ended up being almost identical to Jack's model for consensus with groups of over 200 plus. And after that consensus training, once I understood consensus, I went back and I reread his chapter on consensus because he's a consensus trainer, and now I got it. And that was the only piece that I didn't really, I was like, oh, I'm not sure if I agree with this. And now when I, now that I understood it, it was like, oh, my God, it's the same. It's the same. It's almost, it's almost, almost identical. And the point is, is uh, it's not my vision. And Jack said this, too, which I thought was so beautiful because when he said it, I agreed with him so much. It's not my vision. And I said, right, it's not my vision. It's not our vision. It's not one community's vision. It's the vision. It's the vision. It's the idea that I think that deep down inside all of us have when we say, what does a world that works for everybody look like? Like, how do we create that? And part of the vision is that it's not the only vision. It's the vision for creating a model that will spread and will allow people to adapt it and to be able to do it in the way that they want. That's the solution for everything. And so we're putting action in words. Jack is a partner and a consultant to our project. So he's become a very good friend. And uh, he and I are doing a radio show uh, this Monday. 
at uh, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you're watching this and you'd like to call in, we'd love to have you call in with your questions and comments. Uh, if not, we'll just bring them up, the list of stuff that I get most frequently and uh, that he gets most frequently as somebody who's also been carrying this vision for years. And um, that's it. We're creating the solution to everything. If you want to join us, there's lots of ways to participate. Everything from pioneers to satellite pioneers, consultants and uh, partners to just helping us on the internet, just joining us with internet participation, uh, liking our pages, sharing our pages. The number one thing we need right now, other than we're really pushing for engineers and 3D people, of course, we're still looking for that one right person to find our project to help us out, either by investing in one community or contributing to our nonprofit. People say, what will it take to get one community started? One person. There's lots of people out there with the resources necessary to take our research and development organization to a whole new level, to allow us to get the property that we've been working with for the last two, three years off the market, the county that's already wants us there and supportive of us, to take that off the market so we can publicize and share the location and finish up the other details necessary that we can't really do. There's a lot of details we can't do until we do a site survey and we know that's going to be the location. But the biggest thing is being able to share that location so that people that uh, are waiting on those details before they can apply to help us and become a part of our project and uh, really participate uh, so we can share those details because a lot of people are waiting for that kind of information. And so if you or somebody you know has the resources, by all means direct, it, direct them our way. And if not, hey, we just love the fact that you're supporting our project, that you're there. Uh, following what we're up to, liking us on Facebook, sharing our stuff on Twitter, and uh, subscribing to this YouTube channel, and uh, you know, being a part of world change in whatever way it works for you. So with that, uh, this is the longest blog that I've ever done. I was excited to talk about the solution to everything. Lots of cool stuff happening. Until next week, thank you for everything everyone does. Thank you for following our project, and uh, we'll check in again in a week.